when I'm preparing for tournaments, I'm trying to become the ultimate warrior. My mind and body are synchronized into the perfect state. I meditate for hours and it's impossible to disturb me. Kyron, Love Island's about to start. Hello and welcome to Bayswatch, an official WST production. For episode 19, world number six Kyron Wilson is the headline act. When he invited us over to his Kettering home, Rob Walker found himself in hot water and his best swimming trunks. I haven't come to a health spa. I've come to a town famously managed by Paul Gascoigne and Ron Atkinson. And I've come to speak to a man fondly referred to as the warrior. I think you would have been in a good place at arriving at the Cruise this year. Yeah, I, I managed to sort of pinch the Championship League just before it as well, where I managed to beat John Higgins in the semi-finals and um, I beat Mark Williams in the final. Um, so I sort of had a little bit of confidence going into it from that. Um, the sort of thing for me was I kind of tinkered a little bit with my technique in that tournament so that gave me two weeks to then sort of think about what I was doing. Why do you guys tinker with your technique so close sometimes to a massive event the world's or, or, or the UK's or, or, or another high profile ranking uh, campaign why do you do that? I think sometimes it can give you a new focus um, you know, there's there's an awful lot of pressure when you go to these events, and sometimes if you're not thinking about the pressure because you're thinking about something else within your technique, it can be a little bit like a trigger. Uh, John Higgins and the players, you know, he mentioned he had his own trigger. So um, I kind of went away from that tournament and thought, you know, what can I do differently to try and compete with that sort of standard of snooker? You, you and your brother, well, you might just about get your bum into this one. Have you have you driven these, or would it collapse if you got in there? Yeah, there's. I'm not going to lie to you, Rob. There is the odd wing mirror missing. Uh, a few do need a service and an MOT. <laughs> to accomplish great things, we must not only act but also dream. Not only plan but also believe. I happened to commentate on quite a bit of um, of Sean early on and he was in a little bit of a hole. He had to dig himself out a little bit in the first round against Mark Davis, mm -hmm. and then started potting some nice long balls. And some of the balls he was potting against Yan Bing Chow in the second round were ridiculous. Yeah. So in spite of the form he brought in to that semi-final, you got off to the perfect start. Yeah, um, I remember th for the first two and a half to three sessions, I just played, you know, complete match snooker, really. And I remember the first session, I think I had about three or four centuries um, and kind of shut Sean out. And he had a chance in the last frame um, where he missed a red to the middle, which then gave me my four frame lead. Um, and I think that hurt him a little bit. Um, but, you know, Sean's been there and done it. He knows how to sort of bounce back from a bad session. Um, and unfortunately for me, that's, that's what we've seen. You could be approaching your peak now, this, this next decade, from turning, all being well with health and fitness and so on, from turning 30 to turning 40, you could be, you've got the potential to have the biggest 10 years of your career. Yeah, um, you know, it's, it's probably down to what goes on off the table rather than on the table now for me going forward. Um, me and Sophie have sort of spoken about it quite recently about you know, really dedicating myself to the game more than I ever have done before. Like I said before, I've, I've got a nice social life where I do like to go out and have a bit of fun when I can. Um, and I've not fully, 100% shut myself off and gone full on snooker. So we've spoke about maybe trying to do that over the next year or two. Um, you know, my boys are at an age now where they're starting to understand that when I go away, I'm coming back um, and they know why I'm going away. Um, Finley started charging five pounds for a photograph at his school. So he's starting to make profit from it as well. The, the sort of man that encouraged me to get into Chelsea more than probably anyone, uh, Jim Franco Zola, who 
actually sent me a lovely message one year at the World Championships wishing me well. So that's one of my prized possessions, that is. You're joking. Are you one of these guys that, insofar as you can possibly predict, you will not be satisfied if you've retired and you haven't won the world title? Yeah, 100%. I'll, I'll feel like it's all been, you know, I'll probably be harsh on myself saying it, but like it's been a waste of time. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd be gutted. Um, that's all I want to achieve. That's all I keep working for to try and achieve. Um, and just knowing that I, I do feel like I'm capable of doing it. And um, like I say, you know, if I can keep putting the work in and try my absolute best, you know, in every department, there's still sort of stones that I haven't sort of looked under yet, you know, do a little bit more of the fitness. Um, I know I look like a, a bodybuilder right now in the hot tub, <laughs> but um, yeah, no, there's, there's still things I could look at doing to try and give me that extra 5%. We have got so used to, to Ronnie and John and, and Mark being around and, and what they've achieved and continue to achieve as they're edging towards 30 years mm -hmm. is incredible. At some point it is going to come to an end, yes. the regular success for those three. And that surely means there will be more chances to win the big ones for those of you who are 10 or 15 years younger than them. Yeah, you know, you've seen it with the likes of Yang Bing Tao winning the Masters this year. Um, there's another name that's probably going to be in a similar boat to myself. Um, obviously, you've got Judd at the, at the top of the tree at the minute, and there's not that much dis uh, age difference between us. So I'm looking forward to seeing how that pans out over the next few years and Again, you know, that's an important key to sort of how I develop as, as a player and keep improving. So um, I'm looking forward to the next sort of 10 to 15 years. Um, and like I said previously, you know, I'm looking forward to travelling again. If you'd like to view our tour of Kyron's house, just head to our Facebook or YouTube. Next, we're heading up the M1 to Leeds. I'm Oliver Lyons, and I'm going to take on three of Willow's worldies. Come on. I mean, this is just superb. I just want to hit the black, that would be nice. I've seen it, but Thank I don't you. believe it. Incredible effort from Oliver, and well done to Air 2 from Finland. OK, next on the show, it's comedian Richard Herring. This is a big moment for me. Don't be smashing up. Oh, Christ shot. Shot I'm going to hit him. Hello, it's me again. Hello, welcome to frame 104 of me one versus me two snooker. Oh, it's brilliant. He's putting two reds with one shot. Oh, there's there some beautiful snooker going on here. Oh, me one has done it. 
Richard, you are still the reigning world champion, semi-professional, self-playing snooker player. Yeah. But you've just had your first ever game against a, an actual professional. How yeah. was it for you? Well, you know, I feel um, I felt wrong playing against another person. So I think that put that just meant I couldn't really fully commit to the game. Um, he was okay. He played. He was quite good at snooker. But how would he be against himself? That is the question I'd ask you, and I think he would lose every time. Tell us a bit about how, <laughs> how you got started off with Me 1, Be Me 2. Well, it started as, it's, in my teenage years. I was very obsessed, I think, as a lot of people in my generation were, by um, snooker. Colour television had sort of come in, and so snooker had become increasingly popular in the 70s and 80s. And I think in the 80s, when it was possibly in its heyday, everyone wanted a snooker table, and you could buy like a Joe Davis 6x3 snooker table, which I just badgered my parents for and finally got for Christmas one year. And so I did that as a teenager and, and got quite into snooker and played on, on proper sized snooker tables as well. Uh, but then I was backstage at a, snook, at a comedy club waiting to go on about 10 years ago. And there was a, another six by three snooker table backstage and I started playing myself at snooker again and then on Twitter started doing a commentary. Oh, that was... A it was only a stupid thing to do to pass time. But I realised loads of people kind of identified with the having played snooker against themselves. But also, interestingly, I was just called myself Me One and Me Two as I was doing it, and people were started going, "Oh, I want Me Two to win, or I want Me One to win." And there was no, I hadn't given them any indication of what different personalities they might have. Wake up, sleepy me. Wake up, we're about to do snooze. Uh, sleepy me. Oh, he's just having a little snooze, but no, he's back. And look at that beautiful pot. And so I kind of wondered, just as podcast was starting up, whether I could do a sort of esoteric podcast, which was me playing myself at snooker in audio only. It was back then playing quite badly, describing it quite badly, not being 100% sure of the rules. It sort of spiralled out from, from just childhood, really, is the short answer to the question. He's going to try and double it. Oh, my stars. Me. Everyone's done that when, when they're a kid, when yeah. you're into sport. And you do develop that thing where you're playing against yourself. Again, on a comedy level and an artistic level, the kind of having a battle against yourself. And the point, there's, a sort, there's a sort of pointlessness to sport that I kind of love as well. Playing someone at snooker and finding out who's best at snooker is sort of just a stupid pursuit. <laughs> no offence, everyone. Uh, but it's also sort of an amazing pursuit. So I, I kind of love, you know, I love that, that di di dichotomy between playing a game against yourself that is obviously both unwinnable and unlosable. But, but also, it's an improvisational thing where I'm creating characters and creating persona and creating drama. But it's ultimately a grown man playing on a child's snooker table um, for no reason. Calculating, calculating, me one, 15, me two, 12. My wife, she says ambivalent, I would say, against this project. Um, <clears throat> so when I, I did a thing for the BBC last year and I filmed a frame and got paid a you know, small amount but not an insignificant amount of money and then I said to my wife, look at that, you know, there you go, you said this is a waste of time and after 10 years, <laughs> that works out, £200 a year of it. <laughs> oh, it's catching. Four it points. Catching. I just wanted to ask you as well about gender equality because yes. that's obviously something you've written about and, and spoken about a lot. And it's, the great thing about snooker is it's inclusivity, so anybody can play. Yeah, what's great at, at the moment is that things are changing in lots of sports. There's absolutely no reason women can't compete on an absolutely level playing field. You know, there's a lot of women doing comedy now, which 30 years ago there weren't that many women doing comedy. So there's, there's always a chance for things to change and improve, I think. Yeah. It's so far away. <laughs> I think real snooker is the, the pastiche sport and 6x3 snooker is the real sport because it's, that's too big, you can't reach the balls half the time. It's just crazy. It's like you expand things to parody them and that's a parody of the real game. <laughs> so, you know, I've come here and I've come into the world of two-player snooker and I feel um, that uh, I should never have done that. I think I've, it's a blasphemy against the sport that I play, which is a very different sport. This could be in the middle. This could be in the middle. Going in. It could be in the middle. Oh. I got four points, didn't I? Yeah. And I, if you get seven, if you count the black. Yeah, we'll give you that black. <laughs> <laughs> so I've got 11 points. <laughs> oh, it's beautiful. Oh, no, hold Is on. Is it off? Oh. <laughs> 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 well Still the world champion. self playing snooker. No one can take that away from me. <laughs> these pockets big enough to get a ball in. <laughs> <laughs> so that is almost it for episode 19 of Bayswatch. To close the show, here's Mark Selby, reigning world champion, 
taking on the five cushion challenge. See you next time. The reigning world champion okay. picks up his cue for the first, the first time. time. This is way too soft. Way too soft. Good line, but too soft. Yeah, it was a good line. Oh, this is too hard, I think. Oh, well, it might not be. Go! It's not bad, it's not bad. Go on, go. It's not bad. Oh! oh. I think you I'll should that. measure that, Ive. Yeah. I'll take that, that's not too bad. This could be good. Oh, is that closer? I think that was closer. <laughs>